Here's what you do when you don't find a rainbow's end this time. Here's where you go when it looks like the rain won't end. Don't cry. I'll give you tomorrow. Let me be the one you share it with. And each day that follows. Cause you only have one life to live. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here and welcome to the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. I'm so excited to welcome real life husband and wife, Cassie and James DePiva here today to look back at their time in Landview and where they first met. Cassie and Jim were married on May 31st, 1996 and will celebrate their 28th wedding anniversary this coming May. James joined the cast of One Life to Live as Max Holden in 1987 and Cassie moved over to Landview uh, as Blair Kramer in 1993, where she remained until the show went off the air. Cassie's fans reminded me that it was 30 years ago, last December 17th, that Blair stepped foot for the first time in Landview. Please help me welcome to the locker room, Cassie and Jim DePaiva. Hello there. Hello. Hello. I'm Who's glad that? we're finally here. Hi. Michael Peebo's got nothing on you That's for that song. Right, That's all I got to say. That warms my heart to hear it. He did a great job. Michael R. Jackson sends his love to both of you. He is a huge fan. Uh, he's got a new off-Broadway show, Teeth, and he told me you guys are invited. If you'd like to see it, go see it. Um, he said if you're in New York, but he is a huge he is a huge one life to live fan and soap fan. So um that was actually for a Jerry Verdorn tribute that we had done. Aww. And he had he had uh played Guiding Light first and then went into the One Life to Live theme song. Well, mm -hmm. I, I can relate to both of those, so that's good. <laughs> yes, yes, you could. So tell me what's what's new upstate, still gardening, still farming? Well, well it we're was snowing today. We're covered in a bunch of snow. If I, you know, it's we have about nine inches of snow that it's you can't decide if it's ready to melt because every time it stuff starts falling off the trees, it starts snowing again. So, but it's beautiful up here. But we we ski. We are waiting for the for the flowers you, to you grow. You ski me. I'm yeah, yeah. Me on the slope last thir a month ago. Three weeks ago. Jim helped a six-year-old, was it? We're guessing he was about six. And, and yeah. sadly, like, by helping him, going different ways. <laughs> yeah. he got hurt uh, doing a good deed. Well, needless to say, Jimmy got a nice ride down with a ski patrol to the bottom of the mountain. And he's been... Scariest wearing, ride I've ever been on in my life. Wearing a knee brace ever since. So it's like... Yeah. Okay. What made that ride down scary? He just went straight down the hill, pulling a sled behind him with me sitting on it. Oh, God. Oh, man. Oh, man. This is going <laughs> to hurt when we hit a tree. Just gonna, <laughs> just say, well, he was good. That's all I got to say. He was good. <laughs> That's he, wild. He That's down, wild. Toboggan faster than I ski. So. Are, are you still uh, working in your wood shop up there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we just got a CNC machine, so. My son promised he's going to learn how to operate it so he can teach me. Yeah. JQ moved home uh, probably about a month ago. And Jimmy had a nice wood shop before. But now he has a super nice wood shop. And I'm still waiting for them to make stuff for me. So when that happens, I'll have to let you know. There you our, go. Special, our specialty is making wood shops. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Anybody out there need to, a wood shop, have them come in and wanna, set it up for you. Yeah, the tools are great. <laughs> Can't do a thing with them, but they are great. My, my brother-in-law has very much uh, got like a wood shop in his garage, and he he makes. We have some beautiful pieces in our house. It, it's so or just or just like boxes and lamps. Yeah, um, so, salt and pepper shakers, bowls, a cake plate. Um, he made my father-in-law. You know, because we bought the house we, from my father-in-law for his 80th birthday. He made him a bowl from a tree in our backyard. Aww. Yeah, you know, so like pieces yeah. that mean something. Um, yeah, it, it's so cool what you can do, you know, from with if you have the right equipment and and talented men like you know my brother in law and Jim there. <laughs> um, what was the music? What was the documentary we're watching last night? The music shop. The 
whatever. Oh, I don't know, but it's so worth watching. It's not, uh, it's, it's, uh, Academy Award nominated, and it's about this place and the people in it that are musical instrument repair people for the entire 80,000 kids in the school district of Los Angeles in the music programs. And I wanted them to watch it because I said, that's what I did for seven years of my life. I was I was a trained musical instrument repair man for seven years. But the beauty of this little film is not so much about what these people do. It's their journey and their stories and how doing this has changed their lives. And it's just, it's, it's just, it's, it's great, really it's a, a wonderful, to watch. too bad what we can't. Was, it on? It. <laughs> it was on uh, Disney, it was on Apple. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Jim, how did you get into that? Uh, well, when I was 15, my dad came home and said, would you like a car? And I said, yeah. And he said, great, I found you a job. And the car you're gonna buy. And I was apprenticed out at the age of 15 and a half and had to drop out of the, the show I was doing at school had to give up acting. <laughs> so um, that's what I did for seven years. And that's so I was, yeah, I was a highly trained brass instrument repair man with, and also did guitar work, violin work, uh, was beginning woodwinds and uh, some electrical repair. So that's why having a shop has always been, uh, I've always had shops. See, it's, the it's things like going that home. you're learning today. It's like going home. <laughs> well, and, and the things you know, like, you know, your dad doing that, something that has stuck with you forever. Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, well, it's kind of bittersweet because I decided to become an actor. And uh, when I did that, he was dying of cancer at the time. And and uh, what I was doing, I was taking over the music store and it's what he always wanted to do. And mm -hmm. it, it kept falling through for him on, in his life. And then he died of cancer at about the age of 42. Uh, and he, uh, I said, he said, thanks for trying. I understand. I'll support you in anything you want to do now. And I said, well, I'm gonna go be an actor. And that's when I switched gears and went a different direction. Crazy. And that can't stand that C word, that cancer word, just yeah, awful. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough one. You know, my mom died of that. And how are you feeling? Are you all healthy? Speaking of cancer? Um <laughs> The cancer queen next yeah. to me. Yeah. Oh, I'm good. I'm knock on wood. God is present. God is, you know, all all healing, and I'm just kind of walking grace, so it's good. So I, I, you know, I can't even believe I went through it. And I mean, I'm sure it's changed me, um, but. <laughs> Jimmy was the, you know, Jimmy was the superhero she was, in my cancer. I had it, but he had to carry the load. So she, she just she changed her for about the first three months. And then she goes, okay, life's back to normal. Okay, again. let's go. Let's I, go. I, I need to control everything again. That's right. The, the, the whip came back, came back out. For a year, yeah. she realized she had absolutely no control in her life. And then the second she had the chance to maybe feel she had that, she, she went yeah, back to control. I, I think that is probably the hardest lesson in life for me and my chemical makeup is learning to let go and realize that you don't have any control. And I think that's been hard. No, it's just hard even when, um, now that I don't have my soap, you know, when I had, I had purpose doing the soaps, you know, whether it was Guiding Light, One Light to Live Forever, and then Days of Our Lives, even though Days of Our Lives was off and on for the last eight years, it gave me purpose. And it's not that I don't have purpose and meaning in my life, but I like to lose myself in things like that. And it's hard now just sitting here watching it snow. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> yeah. And it's also uh, sort of structure, you know, yeah. just having a routine. But I think it's awesome what you have done in this time during COVID. And you took something that seemed like, it, like okay, I'm going to interview a couple of people. And it's turned into such a wonderful platform for the fans and then you you chronic you know you can just go back in your history of what you've done you could just write a book a book a book a book a book about all these people and all these things it's well it's sort of you know as some of your fans actually s said today you know it's just a, a little you know when you do an interview it's usually you know three to six minutes on a talk show this sure. is just the you know we're we're looking a little deeper into everybody's lives. And also, I think the thing I didn't realize, we all seriously can learn from each other from our uh, experience.
from our experiences. Um, 28 years this May. <laughs> um, That's how old I was. Well, we, that, wasn't our, that was not our wedding, so you know. <laughs> That's not our wedding. That was not our wedding. That was uh, an event that I did for Ladies Home Journal. Uh, <laughs> that, that I would say maybe 40 I, I, people. I thought it was for the diet program. No. <laughs> so this is. That is. Yes, that is actually not our original wedding. We originally got married on May 31st. But on June 16th, we had a wedding where we married Dreama in the backyard. So that was the wet. That's a wedding that um, uh, came and videotaped. And Jimmy said he wrote this most beautiful soliloquy to me. And I got up and I was like, well, I, well, heck, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I was just going to wing it. <laughs> that I, was terrible. I don't know I, what to say. I, well, can't thanks, I, I can't believe it's lasted this long. Hopefully, but. you'll invest a little more effort in the marriage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, you know, lasted this long. That is that is an, an accomplishment in today's world. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. It, 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 for actors, man, we've been married a hundred years. So. We were, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were married at the, in a judge's office in Kentucky. Yeah, and we joke. And, and I didn't say, know anybody. I was a, but between Billy the, Steve Peak is my best man, the county clerk. Right. <laughs> and between the two of us, we've been married five times. So we 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 don't, and that's not on our soap operas. That's in real life. <laughs> So, you know, we, we take it seriously. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It was a but character it's study. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I was going you, have, you did the I character study. The character, I really get married a lot. <laughs> you did the character study on those previous marriages. Now you've got it. <laughs> well, luckily, she hasn't shot me in real life. That's, That's right. Amazing. Yeah, seriously. Um, do you remember your first impressions of the other? I do. Go ahead, honey. First time I met... Jimmy, I was singing at the Whaler Bar. Do you remember the Whaler Bar where we would go? I probably saw you there. I love the Whaler Bar. Oh, we did. So I was doing, um, my person that I was working with was your brother on the show. What was his name? Russ Anderson. Russ Anderson. So Jimmy came to see Russ and I was, of course, played <clears throat> Chelsea the singer. And so I had this little record label that was interested in some of the songs that I had sung. And so I'm sitting there and and I had sung a song, a lesson I'll never learn that I had written. And I sang it on One Life to, I mean, uh, Guiding Light. Well, Jimmy comes over with a snifter, like, I'm not a shill or anything, but uh, I just, hey, wanted, baby. yeah, had this, you know, and he goes, I just want to tell you that song was beautiful. And I'm like, going, oh my God. Is it, you know, see, no, I came over to say how much I liked it. And you said, I'm talking to a record company. <laughs> that's right. I thought he was just being, and a that's jerk. when I said, I'm not being a shill. I just, Wanted to come over and tell you how beautiful it was and how much I like it. Well, I, I just thought he sounded so insincere. I, just sound, I sound and insincere. That's my job. I know. So I, <laughs> that was my first impression. And then, I, you know, a couple of years later, I auditioned for um, Blair. For Blair, but Jimmy was in Hawaii, so he was unable to do the screen test with me. So I did it with John Laprino, and so. I got the part, which was crazy because it was a, you know, an Amerasian. Nia Korf played the part before, so I didn't even think that there was a, you know, it was a long shot or whatever. So then I met him. He came in the uh, makeup room and he had a white socks, Birkenstocks, and a turd brown bathrobe on. And he came and he goes, Hey, Cassie Wesley. Hey, hey, yeah. that voice I talk, again. I talk like that when I'm not around anybody else. <laughs> he said, "Hey, you're the new Blair. They hired a blonde. You know, just was busting on me." And I was sitting in another makeup chair, and I said, "You know what? You're never going to get hemorrhoids, Jim, because you are a perfect asshole." <laughs> and that's what that's that was our that's we was it was love. That, that's what made him fall, fall in love. Um, were Blair and Max supposed to be together at the beginning? Yes. Well, I took Blair's virginity. With Mia. With, with Mia. With this, because this yeah. other actress who's lovely was played the role for a year. And I, I don't know the reason why they ended that. And Because uh, of her mother. She was trying to save her mother. 
So she ended up marrying Asa. Oh, no, I'm talking about oh, personally you. while while the actress left. But anyway, I was lucky and happy. And so when we first started working together, I was just like, oh, my God. I felt like I had known him forever. I mean, I it felt really familiar to me. Oh, you didn't? Well, no, you didn't say why I got the perfect asshole comment. I right. asked her, I said, let's go, go to lunch. Unbeknownst, it was her birthday. I didn't know that. And she, oh. thought, she thought I was taking her out for her birthday. And I yeah, said, I listen, if, if you're going to work with me, you're going to have to work a lot harder. I went like, come <laughs> on. I, you're, you're, gonna have to, you're gonna have to actually do some work so i'm like going okay okay it's like oh my goodness. so i told the story to robin strasser you know like we were she goes what did he say to you well you just tell him as long as you got me you're always going to be on one life to live i didn't say you were going to be off the show well i said okay. if you're going to work with me you better work harder so they put me with no, roger no. howarth and i was just fine <laughs> <laughs> and God certainly had a hand in this plan. I mean, I think that's how our I think that's how our marriage stayed together. Is they broke us up on probably, the show. Probably, probably. You're probably right. I mean, you know, doing that on soaps, acting it out, it could could definitely cause cause some problems. Jim, take us back to seventh grade and what drew you in to acting. Uh, I was in biology class. And sat across from Debbie Lagapa, who I had a crush on. And I was like five foot one, 150 pounds, short little chubby kid. And uh, meanwhile, everyone else is discovering the ideas of the other sex. Meanwhile, I'm just a little dumpy kid. And she said that they needed people to be in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And would I go uh, audition for it? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> And uh, I had I got snug the joiner, and I had I think six lines, and it was just I just knew I was home immediately. The second I got up on the stage, and I was shy and all these things, and, and I just went hmm. And then that summer I grew eight inches, and my weight didn't change. So the next year I came back, and I was a leading man, and started getting all the lead roles. So and cute as a button. <laughs> yeah, you, all those pictures you have, I, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, I was only a little asshole then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Cassie, for you, you said you were in speech, debate, and theater program in junior high and high. What what drew you in so early? You know what? I think it all started probably singing in church, and we did we did musicals and things, it, it, church program. Also, big 4-H talent shows, uh, demonstration and speeches. So I've kind of always in that. But I thought it was certainly something that I would grow out of. But we had a phenomenal speech and debate coach in high school that took us to the national level. Um, like when I was in high school, senior year, I was voted best actress in the Southeastern Theater Conference. I mean, I, that's kind of crazy if you think about that. I mean, even now it's like, Wow. Um, and we competed. Um, it's called the National Forensic League, but we competed nationally. And I was like, like third in the nation in uh, dramatic interpretation, do it acting. And it was just it was a great opportunity for me. But I didn't think I would ever have a career. In it. And then I went on to Opryland and sang. And I, I don't know, I just got lucky, did plays and stuff like that. What was your earliest or how old were you when you started singing in church? Do you remember? Well, I, you know, probably I know my remember first grade, my teacher, we had we did plays and I would sing there. And, you know, I just always I just always did it. And I just well, Cassie's going to get up and sing for the family. You know, I'm from a big belly aching family and I would if family means <laughs> I would sing a song or do something and you know I and, don't know. And did you actually debate in the debate club? No, I was too dumb for that. <laughs> I, I just did pretend stuff. So I, mean, I, I wish I could say I was a great extemporaneous speaker or a debater. Uh no. I was just on the team. Okay, okay. Jim, when you auditioned for the role of Max, I think you said uh, they were auditioning both for um, your brother and you at the same time. Right. And did you audition with Russ? 
No, no, I I didn't see Russ till New York. Uh, originally, they gave a script and they said you're they're playing two different brothers, but play whichever. Uh, I think they only had the Max uh, outline in <clears throat> California, and I auditioned there, and then uh, they flew me out to New York, and that's the day I met Russ. And uh, they said, and again, we were both doing the same sides, and they said, hey, we want you to do an improv together. And okay, uh, you'd be the bad brother, you'd be the good brother. And they said, no, no, you be the bad brother pointing at me <laughs> and let's be the good brother and improvise this scene. And the, the cameramen were funny. Larry Strax going like, is this an improv? What is going on here? <laughs> so we just did a whole improvisation. And, and before I made it to the airport, back to LA, they'd already called my agent and said, I got the part. And wow. the, role, the part is Steve. That's crazy. Um, what was it about Max that you you know drew you in that made you want to play him? Uh, everything. He was he was uh, much bigger <clears throat> in life than I was. He was he was I was always playing Starbuck in the Rainmaker. That's who he was. He was full of dreams and big ideas and and lots of failures, but those never got him down. He always saw that there was another opportunity. There's no such thing as bad news. He was he was just uh, he was very very different than me at that time. Then as time went on, I got bigger and he got smaller. So then <laughs> I went, why do I want to play this guy anymore? He's just he's got a boring life. <laughs> Ro <laughs> roll reversal, roll reversal for sure. No kidding. Damn. You that, as you said, you you replaced me uh, in the role. Um, did you know it was a replacement? And was it when you were auditioning and screen testing? Were was it for Blair? Like you were well aware? I did not know until after my original uh, audition was with Cami Pam. Jimmy and I were both cast out in Los Angeles for both of our soap for for our soap operas, Guiding Light for Me in Los Angeles and One Life to Live. So when I read for it, the you know, the audition scenes are so over the top, the sexual in you end up, she grabs his hand, she pulls her. I mean, it's like, I just, I remember um, with Cammy, I went like, this is so ridiculous. So I remember sitting in the casting director's office and I threw my legs up and said, I might as well just read it like this, like through my legs, because it's, it was so sexual. It was like, whatever. But then it, you know, I got the part, so I don't know. But I always found those soap opera um, auditions to be so over the top. And there's so much indication and uh, exposition. And blah, I don't know. So funny. So Guiding Light was uh, out in California as well, where yeah. you... When um, Joe Wilmore came out, and I, I had my screen test, believe it or not, with uh, uh, Callahan. What's his first John name? John Callahan. John Callahan. I guess he was on Knott's Landing at the time, and uh, Joe Wilmore asked him to read with a couple of girls, and I remember that's the first time I met John. <laughs> oh, was Joe yeah. executive producer <laughs> at the time? Wilmore. Yeah, Joe Wilmore was executive producer. Executive producer at the time. Yep, I remember when Joe was, oh, wow. Did you ever meet with Betty? Yes, I met Betty, and she was, she was, she was lovely. There was a woman... Uh, Marino was her last name, was kind of head of casting for, I think, CBS. Yeah, I don't but, know. Uh, Betty Ray was quite lovely. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then I was, her daughter was an age with my agent for maybe, you know, three months or something like that, too. Oh, I didn't realize Betty's daughter was an agent. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. Back in the day. That's yeah. wild. And the casting director for ABC out there was Bobby Hoffman. Who did Laverne and Shirley in Happy Days? Those were his claims to fame. He did a lot of sitcoms. Wow. And then he was head of uh, West Coast casting for ABC Daytime. And he fought for me. He fought for me. His uh, execs higher up did not want me. And he kept saying, no, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And went, okay. I, I, I don't remember who I was interviewing. I feel like last week or something. But it, it's so interesting that there are people who just are in your corner you know like how lucky we can be to have somebody in our corner fighting for us that you know you end up jim getting that part because he he wasn't going to take no 
you know, like it's. Oh, he's uh, he, uh, uh, he. I said, why do I keep coming in for these auditions? He goes, well, there are people that are are not sure about you and they don't think you're ready. And uh, and then he was worried because I was kind of wild and crazy looking. I just gotten done doing Moon Children uh, out there playing, you know, from the '60s. My hair was real long, and as you saw, Max had a beaver, a, mullet. On, a beaver on his head when he started. Um, so he says, can you do something? I could cut your hair. And I said, yeah, sure. So I just took a bunch of grease and greased it all down and showed up and then uh, came in with a, a big attitude. That That's wild. Who are some of your mentors along the way? Who, you know, maybe he might be one who helped for both of you. Well, it's always going to be the, I mean, uh, you had the Linda Williams, first drama teacher in high school which high level, uh, Harvey Berman at Diablo Valley College. He's uh, passed away. He was, he went to college with Carol Burnett and he directed operas around the world and theater around the world, things like that. He'd uh, been out of UCLA. So, uh, and then he introduced me to another director, Les Abbott, who had worked a lot in theater in Britain and on uh, television in LA. And he said, I want you to do my play. You've been recommended by Harvey. And I said, well, I'm going to LA. It's time for me to do this for real. And he said, well, if you come do my play, I will introduce you to your first agent and you will get on General Hospital. I went, okay, <laughs> That's, that works for me. And, uh, and yes, I, that's how I got my first agent and uh, Pat Amaral. And then uh, I met uh, Marvin Page and I was uh, mm. the greenhouse waiter and extra on General Hospital, and one day it turned to a whole day thing. You can find it on the internet. My, <laughs> my, my uh, seduction of Emma Sams in the restaurant. It was so cute. It's very funny. It's she very looked funny. a little. Lot, I, I watch it and I go like, "Oh my gosh, Jake, you look so much like Jimmy." But yeah, it's a very Cary Grant, uh, snappy repartee kind of thing, and it. Uh, I thought it was terrible when I first saw it. Now that I look at it, I go, "Yeah, it's kind of cute." You know, I find it interesting um, how you don't know this until much later in life is that when you walk into an audition, people really want you to succeed. Now you walk in there scared out of your mind or even in any situation, it's, I think we always try to put a negative spin on stuff, but it makes you, it makes a, a good casting person look good. Mm -hmm. If they bring a good actor to, mm -hmm. to the table. So, um, if that that was a hard lesson or long yeah. lesson to learn. I went back to uh, um, I went back to L.A. to and say thank you to uh, Bobby Hoffman, <laughs> and he said, "I want you to know I want you to look up on my wall at the letter up there, and uh, it's uh, it was a letter from Paul Rausch thanking Bobby Hoffman for sending out Holly Gagne and myself, like uh, one other I think." And at the bottom of it, in, in James to Piva, I think we found gold. Think how nice and I, I went, well, damn, the price of gold must have gone down a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and wow, Paul Roush has a horror. I was like, look. So, I know. So, so that's, uh, and, and Paul. You know, was, I love Paul. Paul but that, you don't, he was a huge you don't get that from Paul huge to know champ. he did that. Paul, I would say, Paul, I'm going to mm -hmm. do something. I don't think the censor's going to like it. And he'd come out and he'd say, he'd, he'd watch it in rehearsal, which he'd never do for anybody. And I would do whatever in dress rehearsal. And he said, you know, I know you're going to come through when it's time to take. I said, I need the dress rehearsal just to mess around and find out what is what and what's wrong. Uh, if I got to have the chance to be wrong. And uh, he was he was always very, very giving in that way. I love that note. That's yeah. really beautiful. You're in shock, aren't you, Alan? Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, I, my, uh, my success as Max Holden is directly attributed to, to Paul, to him and, and what he uh, saw in me and what I could bring Paul, and, and giving me the freedom to do it. Paul was really incredibly smart. So I would take it you would not probably enjoy soaps today because of the speed and lack of that no. ability to to figure it out. Because Well, he did um, General Hospital you know, for about a year. And it was a whole different experience for you. There's, uh, there's no joy in it for me. Uh, you know, I grew up loving theater and in theater is a whole lot of time to play 
and have fun. Uh, you know, I was directing on One Life to Live for a while. Mm -hmm. And when it came up again, and that was when uh, digital editing came in. And all of a sudden we started, instead of directing a whole show that day, you would craft a whole show and figure out everything, the flow, the peaks, the everything. And you would have that show to do. And it was very demanding, but very fulfilling. And then it became, okay, now we can just chop everything up. So instead we're going to do eight scenes from this set. So we don't have to put up another set. The actors are here. So you're doing chunks from other shows. And so you're starting to do generic openings for each scene, generic closings for each scene, because you don't know where the next shot is going or where it's coming from. So I said, it's like going from directing a play to directing a scene study class. And I said, I, at that point, I said, uh, we don't need to put that in my contract anymore. This is not, I do not enjoy this. So I'm not, I'm not going to hold you to it. It's, it changed a lot over the years. Cassie, mentors for you. I know you've mentioned, you know, how um, Gary Tomlin has always looked after you, but I'm curious, yeah. maybe before Gary. Well, I had my high, Judy Woodring, huge supporter of mine all of my young adult childhood even in junior high she was like grooming me for high school for the speech and debate team and um the theater um and as a college student she was very supportive and helpful and i i mean i i would not know or have the discipline that it takes to do what it takes for us to do the memorization the 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 work if i if it hadn't been instilled in me even in high school because we would compete on weekends and it was you know on top of everything else it was it was like being practicing as an athlete um but gary tomlin yeah he's always kind of had my back I, you know gary's an interesting cat you know he is not um I always joke and say it's like when you say hello to Gary, you take two steps forward and he takes three steps back. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not finished talking to you. I think I maybe probably make him nervous, but um he's he was he's the reason I'm on was on Days of Our Lives. He brought me in. And I do think that Gary Tomlin's uh vision and thinking outside of the box of daytime in that period of one life to live when we were doing live shows musicals, uh, mm -hmm. switch shows, that was all his creativity and pushing the envelope and actually pushing the network to do things differently. Because at that time, you were seeing the slow loss of viewership. And this was any way they could possibly generate some new creative activity to get more eyes on the on the program. And um, I remember that live week, Oh my gosh, Jimmy and I both were very involved in that show. But I'm gonna no, no, no. You were very. You had all the heavy lifting. Oh my gosh, but I went in like I wanted heavy lifting. I yeah. didn't know. <laughs> it was a breeze for me. I was rewatching our first interview with Hillary and Bob Woods, and Hillary pointed out that it was you, Cassie, and how much yeah. you had to cry and during oh. those live. I went up like two weeks before and said, okay, when it came out that we were doing, I said, okay, I just want to let you know, I'm taking a week off that week. That's I'm, it's, I'm not, I cannot do this. I cannot, I will throw up. I'll have diarrhea for three days before I can't do this. And I remember just, just, it was so, so hard for me. And I joked and said, I had fear stink all over me because of anxiety. I was just like pitting out going, whatever. <laughs> And my first scene was with, I had to carry a freaking baby down that flight of steps at the at uh, Dorian's house. And it's like, you never knew what was gonna happen. It's like, oh my God, I have to do this live. It's like, it was crazy. And then it was, you know, really wonderfully written scenes with Roger and I, and he's always great yeah. all the time. And it was, it was fun. Uh, one another thing Gary did was the gender reversal show which where um i played gabrielle and fiona played max and, and i don't remember i did i was on that episode. Uh, but I was everybody out. was playing uh their opposite todd the played show. vicky vicky played todd and so i'm 
I'm downstairs and I've uh, I've got my robe on with my wig and my makeup and oh. my stockings and my high heeled shoes. I don't have my dress yet because I'm waiting to put it on right before going on and the fire alarm goes off at one last time. <laughs> so on 66th Street, you were walking out. There was only one in, one but, way in, and one between, way out. Between the park and Columbus, yes. Yeah. So I, I walk out there, and and there I am, the world's ugliest woman. Uh, oh my God! Is there. that on YouTube? Because I would like to see you play Fiona. I don't, I don't, we didn't have. We didn't. Oh, that it's probably oh, yeah, it's got to yeah, be yeah, there. The whole know. episode's got to be there. That's. Uh, it, I think what's called trading places. I, I will look for that after this. That that is brilliant. I mean, I can't even imagine trying to be Fiona. That's scary. <laughs> that is that is scary. Well, Jimmy, yeah, and my Fiona, Fiona accent so was good. pretty bad. I'm the water. <laughs> I did not have a good Fiona accent. Yeah. But oh, you guys were amazing! <laughs> amazing, amazing. I mean, talk about uh, you know the late Andrea. You know, you started out with Andrea, and then you know magic with you know Fiona. Yeah, I, well, it's uh, I, yeah, I, until you said that, I completely it, it slipped my mind about Andrea's passing and just how sad that was. Uh, Andrea watched out for me. She took care of, you know, she's, you know, she had, she was paired with John Leprino when I came on. And I watched the show as a fan of the show. And I went, you're not bringing me on to mess up these two, are you? They're great. <laughs> of course, that's what I was there for, was to mess the two of them up. And, and, uh, Andrea was very welcoming, and Fiona came on about the same time. They became great friends. Uh, Andrea was in Fiona's uh, wedding party, uh, and it was just, it was great. It was it was great with Andrea for like the, a year or so, and then uh, there was so much backstory with Fiona, and it was, it was clicking with the fans. That's what they were, back then, that was another thing about the way soaps were done then, is we weren't so far ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, now you could be six mm-hmm. months. I would days is what well, they, a we year. Were, we were I don't know. I, at, the top, one, at one point, I so we were we were just a few weeks ahead because we were basically shooting a live show pretty much every day, and so when the fans reacted to something, they they changed it. They changed the writing. They they saw which way the wind was blowing, and they went with it. It was great. Uh, the opposite side of that was when I was uh, who was I working with. Me? Uh, no, no. <laughs> you don't remember? No, I, I'm so bad at the names anymore. That part of my brain is going. Susan Benton? No, after that very, very end. Um, oh, Eileen. Eileen, yeah. So the Eileen. Oh, yeah, Roxy. And, and Eileen, and it was, and I said, this is, and I had such nasty things to say to her. I mean, it was just horrid. Max I, did. I, I remember Max did. Right. Max and I, I remember I, I, I said I apologize, but it says I have to call you a greedy drunken troll. <laughs> and uh, and then we had the whole thing where uh, we got married when I was stupid drunk and and all that. And they see and it was it, it, it was it was clicking. It was it was really working and it was great and absolutely adore working with her. And we were having the greatest time because we just let it go. And uh, uh, one of the writers from one of the soap opera magazines. Blondies. Carolyn. Yeah. Carolyn. 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 Carolyn saw us on the street. And, you know, I hadn't had much contact with Carolyn at that point because it really wasn't doing anything on the show much anymore. And she came up and she just started saying such wonderful things about me and Eileen. She was, we were there together. <laughs> and we're just looking there, just smiling because the show's so far ahead. We know that they've already said, forget it. This couple's gone. They'd already written us off. It was, and we were like, oh, that's great. We're glad you love it. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, that's hard. I mean, so, I, I, I'm sure, you know, doing soaps and being writers is, it, uh, yeah, you set out a game and it's got to be, I don't, I couldn't think of anything harder. I, I agree with you. But it's unfortunate. There's just so many cooks in the kitchen, you know, and, and writers who switch and who don't know a show or don't know the history you know it, it, it it's a shame because you know here we are 12 years after one life has gone off and there are a lot of fans here because of the love of max and blair you know like it i just don't think powers well, of be fully grasped no and i keep thinking well you 
if they're not going to do go back and do one life to live, which it looks like they're never going to do, I, you know, what is to say? Why can't you do like a six episode, 30 minute episode for doing a little short little mini series? It can't be that. You shoot it on the set of General Hospital, you know, like, what, on their downtime. But um, I just think the fans would love it. And another yeah. way, of thinking, and I want to give a big shout out to Susan Batten, because when I got to work with her, uh, and back then, when you did a whole show in one day, you get to the end of the day and they go, OK, the show is three minutes too long. You have to cut this, 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 this. Shoot it now because we're running out of time. Or they'd say, we are we have two minutes. That was and like one time I ended up doing a big giant mud dance with Susan Batten when we discovered Serenity Springs. That was everything was improvised. So you got two minutes. Go for it. It might have been longer. <laughs> but we had with Susan, we had uh, we were given a Valentine's Day show. And she, oh, called, so she, called, she said, I'd never say this. And I'm like, oh, I never say that. This sounds like you. And so we just traded all of our lines. <laughs> I read I read all, all of her lines. She read all of mine. And then one of the other directors that follows the show closely and watches everything goes, did you two trade all of your dialogue? I went, yep. <laughs> that, that, I love that. And then um, we had one. We had one that was so boring. This be quick. We had one that was so boring. Show the scenes were so boring. We said, "Oh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna teach each other judo." <laughs> so we we were practicing judo moves during the whole scene. That's and wild. Right and that's the kind of stuff they let us do back then. You know, I love that you pointed out because I don't know that fans know, but there are moments where you've studied. Let's say it's a five-page scene with your partner and they say you you know we have to cut two minutes you have to relearn that oh i mean like, they would like cut that. it somebody would bring you here's the changes you'd have to learn that by the end of the day oh no my, oh, my, you my have to worst, learn it in the next five minutes my worst was i had a three page i had three freaking pages of monologue and worked hard to learn that whole thing and right as we're about to tape it they said throw out the middle page I went, what? Yeah, that's that's so tough. I just did page one and three and somehow <laughs> tried to make them connect. But no, there was no go learn that this was like now. Now that's cuts would come right from the booth going, take this, this, this. Okay. We call we call yeah. we call them pink pages because that's how they would show up at One Life to Live. They would you all of a sudden you get a pink page. And so we would joke and say, Did you get your pink pages? And just to mess with somebody. But uh yeah, but you know, that's yeah. how you worked on the fly. That's why soap operas always felt very improvisational to me, because it was it was that it was instant gratification, and I love working like that. I mean, as stressful as it is, and how much I go, oh my gosh, I loved it. Well, I know that that's what's so funny, you know, because you you do. First of all, I wanted to show you this because I, I think a fan had posted this, but this was a uh -oh. a promo uh -oh. for Guiding Lights fiftieth. Um, but you, Cassie, you spoke that you were petrified the first two years at Guiding Light of being let go, but that you still get nerves. Um, I can't oh. imagine what that light week really, if you really get nerves all the time, that yeah. must have just been. Well, you know, um, Guiding Light was, I was, I was coming, I'd just done that little horror film that I did, Evil Dead 2. But basically for the last five years, I had only done commercial work and I'd been singing. So when I was cast as Chelsea, she was a singer. But as far as my, I mean, I'd taken acting classes in Los Angeles, but it was a hard, that's hard to be thrown in to do something. And moving to New York was petrifying as well. Um, I was and say, she was afraid to walk to and from work yeah. for two years. And I just felt oh, like, right. were you really, were you afraid yeah. of New York? Well, I was so broke too, that I could, I had to walk and I had no idea that it really took 45 minutes to walk from 42nd street all the way down to 26th street where we, where we take. Yeah. But I, uh, um, it, it, it was just a, a crazy time. And I kept thinking, well, they're going to find out I'm yeah. a fake, but I can't do this. So, and then I, you know, I was working with Grant and Michael O'Leary, who were nice as they could be at times, but uh, they were tough. They were like mean little shits to me some of the time. They were so yeah, I was, used I was to those a sweetheart assholes. by the time. So that's why I could say those words. To, like I've already been there 
do. And they were prankster for sure. They certainly were. And, you know, yeah. I, it was, um, it just, you know, I learned to work in that kind of environment. And um, I would definitely say my time on Guiding Light, I, maybe I would have stayed there longer if I'd felt more comfortable there. I just never felt like, even though I, I had good, I just never felt like I was a really part of the team there. And that's kind of weird, but I just never felt that way. Whereas on One Life to Live, I just feel like it was very solid. Mm. Benjamin brilliant. says you were truly brilliant and lovely and natural as Chelsea. Oh, thanks. Um, you know, it, it's kind of crazy because on One Life, you had a daughter. Who just had a baby. <laughs> Who just had yes. a baby. Yeah, she sent me a video and ah, look at that. There's the baby. Isn't Kira that right? Guy Crusoe, if I pronounce it right? Look yeah. at that angel. She sends her love to you both, and she just came home. Ah. Oh, I got a te I, I, I texted her this morning. So I, she sent to me all these pictures, and she sent me a video showing me. I mean, she Kristen's going to be the best best mom ever, and she's just. I mean, I still think of her as six. But um, she's not. Um, and I'm so happy for her. So, so happy for her. It's got to be so wild just seeing that evolution of oh, your yeah. relationship. And yeah, it's beautiful. Cra crazy, crazy, crazy. Cassie, talk about those first days on One Life, which were kind of nerve wracking too, in a bathing suit and working opposite <laughs> Eric. You know, we, it was one of those. That, you know, you audition, you audition, audition, and then all of a sudden, okay, you're starting next week. So for whatever reason, they had delayed and pushed, and I did three episodes in one day, and back then, it was kind of crazy, but it was, um, yeah, I was in a bathing suit, and I, my scenes were with Erica Slezak and Roy Fennis, and we were, Blair was down in Florida, and they'd come to do some investigative stuff or whatever, and you know, all I was doing, trying at that point was to hold my stomach in and not town, sound too Southern. So <laughs> I was like, well, yes, I know, you know, so whatever. But I don't know. I, I look back at that and I just go, like, I'm so awful. And, and I will say my heart goes out to Erica and her entire family. Horrible. Very, very, very sad. And it's, it's everybody's kids came to the set. It was like it was their dogs, their kids all came. So <laughs> the dogs, their kids, yeah. So we we got to watch each other's children grow up. So it 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 was really a loss uh, to the bigger family, also, and, yeah, and very, very, very saddening. And and uh, Brian was was there, and you know we we all got to know him. I love Brian, and and so my heart goes out to him. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. What what are some of your favorite storylines there? I mean, Cassie, you know, as as your fans, thirty years. Well, gosh, there's so many to pick from, Alan. <laughs> um, no but kidding. I loved. There's so many moments with Jimmy that I loved because we got to do comedy. You know, we had a lot of comedic Big stuff, sticky stuff. Um, we need somebody to write. A comedy for you two. Oh, I would love that. I mean, he's his timing is impeccable, and I just kind of follow the lead. But he is, it, it was really fun. I know that there were scenes that it was maybe before his wedding with Kelly. Kelly. We were in the rectory, and we were, we just had sex or something, and he had clothes, and we were tumbling and bobbling. And then we had our furniture big, always falls over when we then were we had drinking. this four wall sex scene in Atlantic City during his gambling storyline, which he was brilliant in, that um, Jim, Jill Mitwell directed it, and there was only one cameraman inside Gene Kelly, Gene Kelly and we were given marks to hit. So you're gonna throw, you're gonna Close climb up him, you're, he's gonna twirl you around. You're gonna throw, it was like, we were like- So they oh. built four walls? Yeah. The four walls, it was, so it was like being in a, an enclosed room and- oh, wow. uh, and I it, hope it, you can't find and, that on and, the internet. Anytime I have those kind of scenes, I spend a lot of time. I it was a habit because I would direct them, and it was one of the things that uh, myself and whoever I was working with, I would I I love soap operas and I love the romantic and the passion and the everything. So I would 
come in in the morning every time and go, this is what I'm thinking. Oh, and he'd also come in like, and, I've got an idea for a song that needs to play during this scene. Yes, you know, this he, is a song he, you should play. He blah, saw blah, blah, the whole picture. All the time. So it's... Uh, but well, that's, so, that's the beauty of you watching before you ever got to land yeah. you. But the four, wall, the four wall scene, it was like going, okay, you're up the chest drawers, I grab you like this. It's like one of my favorite Rodin sculptures. And I just always found it so incredibly erotic. And we knocked but, over. But by the time we did it, we were bleeding. We were <laughs> and when we saw when we saw the scene, I just said, I don't think they can put this on daytime TV. This is a little too. This is pretty. I, I think Michael Malone. Graphic. called. It was Michael like, Malone was writing. He called and goes, Ooh. I can't believe you guys did that. I said, Well, you wrote it. <laughs> oh, I just I did uh, one scene with uh, the first love scene with Max and Gabrielle. And I had I walked in and Peter Miner was the director, loved Peter. And so directors, you know, they're doing a whole show. So if you come in and say, I've got this, you want to use it. And Peter always said yes. So in the whole thing, I choreographed the whole thing where, you know, I'm taking her clothes off and everything like that. But I did it so it would all be one shot. So arm was here. This was here. It's like when they direct now where you could never see what act, what was really going on. But your mind thought all this stuff was going on. And so when I finally saw it, he had to put one cut in it. And I said, why the fuck is it cut? Excuse me. I was supposed to talk Oopsie. To uh, why is that cut there? I went, okay, I'll forgive you for that one. That's so funny. You know, we um, learned a lot working with the directors of Daytime, too. They had oh, a yeah. lot on their plate. And they, you know, Gary Tomlin, getting back to him, he wanted you to, he didn't have time to wait around while you trying to figure out your line. You, you needed to be up on set, know your lines and be ready to go. I mean, I've, I've, I have seen him go, okay, we're moving your scenes to the end of the day because you're not ready and you don't want that public humiliation. So he's mm -hmm. like, I gotta go study my lines. Yeah. That, I would, and, I would be called out on that. Yeah. And in the beginning we had a lot of people that had, uh, learn their craft doing live plays on TV. I mean, they were doing live TV. Uh, David Pressman had done some of the most classic stuff from old black and white TV when they used to put these whole things on at once. So we had him, we had Peter, we had so uh, Michael Gleona, who had come over from uh, Santa Barbara was such a blessing because he was just batshit crazy. He was, he'd just go like on, it was basically, don't bore me. Don't bore me. He would focus on the two people behind you at the bar that weren't talking if he thought you were boring. That's the way he would work shots. So you made sure that you kept him entertained. You know, and, and how did you make the transition into directing? Was it always something you wanted to do? Uh, I saw this uh, something I, I, I wanted to go into. And probably, and I, I spent a lot of years working with Stella Adler, and she said, uh, you know, you really know too much. You should be a director, not an actor. And the last person she said that to is Peter Bogdanovich. So I went, well, yeah, okay, I'll think about it. And it's it, and it is something I enjoy doing. What I loved about it is early on, especially on One Life to Live, I had to have such a big ego because I felt so fragile. And as I, the way I put it, I said, when I came into One Life to Live, you couldn't get my head through the door. And as a director, I had to have absolutely no ego at all. I walked in that everybody knew more than I did about what they were doing. And all I had was the vision and how to get there. And it is, I, I absolutely love the directing. So for it me, was it was really like, good. It was like, it was like Zen meditation. It was nice for to me. me. I was going to ask you, what was it like having him direct you? It was good. You know, we also did a, a he directed a, a film mm -hmm. film up here. We did that mm -hmm. while we were working on One Life to Live. It never, you know, the producer never put it out, but it was a good little feature film. But he directed and it's great. It was, great it, was, it was very funny that some of the crew had said, we've never worked on an independent film where everything gets done by the end of the day. I said, well, uh, I was trained in soap operas. There is no tomorrow. <laughs> right. It either gets done today or it's or it right. didn't, don't come back. That's right. Yeah, that that episode. Um, James, before I forget, uh, GT Lem had asked, did you get a lot of fan reaction, uh, fan letters during the gambling addiction story? Did you hear from viewers? Not particularly. 
no, it was, uh, and for me, it was kind of a interesting time because I looked at it, the storyline, Michael uh, Malone and Josh were very, very excited about it. And it was a great thing to play as an actor, wonderful thing. Uh, but if it were a movie, it would have been perfect. But I said, you're basically, you've decided to kill my character because if my, my character is nothing but a high stakes gambler. And if you take away that part of his personality, there's nothing uh, left. But as far as, as far as the fan reaction, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. I, it was a very dark, it was a very dark, dark thing to play. And I know a lot of people have gone through stuff and, and gambling addiction was still not high on the, you know, but nowadays they have a commercial every five minutes talking about a gambling addiction, but back then it was still a new thing. And yeah, during this story of gambling, Blair was addicted to Max. She was addicted to him, had to have obsessed, and he was obsessed. And so she used the gambling to take him down, a, a take Max down a rabbit hole so she could be with him. Well, that just showed up again recently. Tanya sent you one, a clip of where I'm in Atlantic City with Blair and uh, Luna shows up. Oh, yeah. To find out was what great. the hell happened to me. And it was like, ooh. Went, ouch. I don't, yeah, I felt ill after yeah. watching that scene. It, 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 it was <laughs> written wonderfully. Yes, it was, it was very, very well written. That's funny. Um, Cass, somebody was asking, do you remember what song they you sang for Sharita Bowers tribute? Yeah, I don't need a, <laughs> a fan. A fan was asking, um, Jim, I know, you know, they, they, um, you know, portraying Max became more difficult and you had a lot of anger, but I wanted uh, you to talk about sort of what helped you, the program that helped you let go of that and tell everybody, you know, sort of what you're doing today, sort of full circle. I love full circle okay. moments. Well, it, it, by the end, uh, <clears throat> I, I really wanted max to last one year more than my alimony uh <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the truth and uh it's exactly what happened but uh, but so you're saying you really would have left probably a year sooner if that wasn't uh, the case. no that was like six or seven years of that so it was it was a downhill slide for quite a while and it was yeah one of the problems when you have a, a character like Max or any of the other one, uh, the characters that really catch on with the fans is that you then get a new head writer, you get a new executive producer, and they don't know what to do with you. Mm -hmm. They don't get you. They don't, you know, they, you know, there was only one Paul Rush. And so they each have their own way of going about it. And But you're too valuable to the network. So they can't fire you probably would have done me a world of good to be fired. But, and I did, I did a lot of things in the hopes that I'd get fired and I didn't. Uh, so anyway, it, it, I was in a dark place. Didn't want to act again. Uh, didn't really know what I wanted to do again. Uh, and I didn't know why I, I become someone I did not like someone I did not recognize, did not know. Uh, and then I happened to, uh, I was invited by Nathan Perdee to come guest teach a class he was doing on camera and there's this uh, strange small woman running around in a in a gym suit and she was very bizarre and during one of the breaks she says here i think you should read my book i went okay she hands me her book it's uh the last word on power by tracy goss and and <clears throat> i went out later that evening with nathan and i said what was that woman <laughs> Was she a student? Was she an assistant? Was she a teacher? Did she run the school? What would, he goes, yes. He goes, that's a Tracy. And he proceeded to tell me the story of Nathan had been a bodyguard, not a bodyguard. Yeah, excuse me. He was a bounty hunter. Nathan was a bounty hunter. Hey, you and, need to interview him. He's fantastic. And he came to Los Angeles and he met Tracy through these programs she was running for actors and writers and producers and things like that. And she oh. is the whole reason that he had it. it a life as an actor he's she's the whole reason because of what she inspired him to do and he talked about the program she had and it, it's it's about making the impossible happen but it's also uh losing who you think you are 
Uh, and he said that she would like to give me a scholarship and she did. And going through it, I recognized immediately why I'd been so angry those last years, why I had been so shut down, why I had been so closed off. And it was very, very simple. Once I was made aware of it and I was able to dismantle the things that were triggering me to rage. And uh, I, I stuck around as a, a coach and now as a leader uh, in it. I'm going to Texas on uh, Sunday to lead another program for a week. And it's, it's, it's meant for uh, business executives. It's, it's, it's transformational leadership for people that are at the top of the game who've gotten to the top and who they've been their entire lives is now in the way of them going to where they or getting what they really, really want. But it, you're saying it's you, the program is, but you know, you were acting on one life to live and Nathan was a bounty hunter. <laughs> well, that was, it, about, it was years later that, uh, that yeah. uh, I met Tracy, but yeah, when Nathan, before Nathan got uh, uh, young and the restless, he was originally young and the restless. So this was back in LA. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember. Say the name of the book again. I want to look it up when I'm done. The Last Word on Power, Tracy Goss. And, That's incredible. Uh, it's uh, worked. I've worked with uh, thousands of people now, and it was. I had a one of one touching moment was when uh, someone from Mexico, who had been uh, working with us, and he he stood up and says, "You have no idea the." effect you've had on thousands of lives in Mexico because of, you know, you're working with the top people and working with, and they're working with people. And then this whole thing moves through the entire culture. So, uh, no, I get to, I get to, I, every time I go, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do it. Cassie goes, you know, you love doing it. I go, yeah, but I just, and he the, comes it's, back it's, it's like, getting, it's like getting a great story. role. You go like, it's too much. I don't want to do it. Boom. And then you come back and, and, uh, I've, I'm so happy. I, I, well, see, I see how magnificent, wonderful people all are. You know, it had such a major impact on your life. Mm -hmm. And now you're having an impact on many, many others. Yeah. And it, it's the interesting thing is part of part of the process, too, is taking a stand on someone. And I would say, I don't. Why does Tracy keep me around? Because if you thought I was a monster on the set of One Life to Live, you should have seen me in this program. I went, wow. wow. While you were doing it with her initially? While, while I was doing it, yeah. There were several times when they said, uh, uh, the company's been talking to their lawyers. And <laughs> what happened? And this and that. And I'd write out detailed things of what happened. And nothing ever came of it. But it was it was. Also, the thing is, working with actors is different than working with people in business or normal people. Uh, you know, actors are used to being poked and prodded and saying, you know, that sucks or do it again. Or you, know, you have to take direction. That's part of the job. But regular people, when you talk that way to them, or if you just walk up and say, OK, you no, know, like that, put it there. Uh, they will just, well, of course, actresses will do that to you now. You can't touch them. Um, <laughs> she will. I mean, they'll. They flip out. They flip yeah. out. Yeah, and now they have. Um... And it's also it's also a very very deep search into your your fears, and mm -hmm. so it's it's you're they're very fragile. They're very vulnerable, and 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 you're basically letting go of who you have always believed you've been your entire life. Mm -hmm. You're letting go of the all the security blankets are gone. You're kind of bare naked out there, and it sounds tough. incredible. Yeah. It is. sounds sounds helpful. Um, Cassie, you mentioned actually backstage and I was going to ask you, I mean, I know, you know, when he goes on some of these trips, you said you go visit your mom. Um, and I think you drive, correct? Yes. Because it's so, easier to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we, we do that to North Carolina, to my sister. We, yeah. we love taking the car. You rather. can't get there from here. It takes two flights anyway. So, up, you know, and if there's delays or whatever, you're stuck. So, I go and I um, usually I have my dog, which you can hear him downstairs barking. Um, but I stop off on the way in Cleveland to see Robin Strasser. So that's just an added beautiful bonus that I spend time with her. And then 
I spend time down in Kentucky. Then on my way back, I stop off again and see her. So Robin says, it's terrible. I had to move to Cleveland to see you. And that's like, <laughs> so it's they were both great. in New York, never saw each other. Right. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Love that. Fan, fans love that, you, you know, the two of you catch up. Cassie, I love that you shared a story. Um, first of all, I mean, going bringing Blair to General Hospital had to have been a blast. Mm -hmm. um, but talk about Jane Elliott told you early on uh, after you had your son. Oh, my connection mm -hmm. to Jane Elliott was through Gary Warner, actually, who wrote all those soap opera books that probably all of you all have the one life to live book on your coffee table. Uh, but he was really a good friend of Jimmy's to start off with, but we were invited to a backyard party of 4th of July and Jane Elliott was there. And we had just found out that JQ had been diagnosed with profound hearing loss. And it was, we could barely even talk about it at the time because it was just devastating. Um, and she just grabbed my face and said, you know that JQ chose you to be his mom. I'm like, yeah, okay. She was just so wonderful. And you I do been, need to remind him of that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you chose it. You chose it. Don't blame me. Can I have a do-over? <laughs> um, but I've had that a, a connection with her since that moment. That's and, amazing. Um, and he's, he's what, 27, 26? Yeah, he's going to be 27 in May. If we're having our 28th, he's going to be 27. So he's, yeah, that's kind of crazy. But he's he's just recently moved back. And uh, um, that's why we can say, yeah, he's like, like I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's great. He's good figuring it out. You know, he was at college up at Rochester during COVID. And I just feel like, all those kids during that time were kind of robbed of of that that moment, those two years at least. All the connection. Yeah. yeah. All the connection you those last two years and the and even friend and friendships and you know, yeah. we were so he's it's it's just hard. It's just hard. And you know, we all have to find our way and he's on he's finding his a, way. And we really can't give any advice because the world is so different now. I would mm -hmm. I wouldn't even know how to suggest to anyone to become an actor at this point it is such a different thing it's certainly a far cry when i used to run down to the printer with one typing change because i got another part to have them print up another 200 copies and then get another part yeah. the next week and then i have to go down and do it again and i don't type i don't i mean all the stuff we used to have to do drive down, drive down to the agents to pick up the script at midnight outside their door you know all those things and, and but they're because and also the meeting people you don't meet anybody nowadays. It's it's all like this, and it's a it's a it would be very very hard for me I know to give anyone advice on on pursuing an acting career. I wouldn't and, know how to. Talk. And you don't have to leave your house to audition. You used to have to run up and down you know the yeah, streets of New York to get somewhere. That's yeah. what that's what living is about, and connecting with people is huge for my type of personality. So isolation, you know, it, it only adds to anxiety for me. So I, it does. I'm an anxious person. Uh, no, I was just going to say we both have very large auras, but they only work if we're in the same room with you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Whatever that means. What, it just doesn't translate. What? Um, but I had an audition like two weeks ago with – a Zoom audition, which I've never done before. I've only, Jimmy always tapes me and he's my director and I always feel like I suck anyway. And and he's like, you, got, you, know, you want to do this again? No, it's, 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 I'm sweating. I'm, I'm having my fear sink moment. Um, but I it was, it was nice to have an audition where I could at least see the Somebody. reader and casting person. And I had not experienced that. So that's a, that's a step up. I didn't up. get the part, but it's a step up. That's that's, that's 2024. Um, I, I won't keep you much longer. Um, Kathy just wrote, I've always appreciated Cassie's heart and kindness to her fans. And that's what I wanted to mention. The fact I, I know in December they made a huge, huge celebration on social media. You got presents about, you know, the 30th anniversary. Okay. Let me just tell you what 
my fans did on behalf of my 30th anniversary and my father's passing, which he passed uh, in May, May 24th of last year. I didn't know. Tanya, who runs my website and has really just been very hands on and getting my information out to people for the last 25 years, ever since One Life to Live. But I met her at a Super Soap weekend. I was just going to ask. Thank you for saying it. We met playing a game and we actually won, but that's how I met her. <laughs> um, she reached out to my core people that have followed me through the internet, through letters, through my singing shows, whatever. They show up for me always. Emotionally. From, from, Ch from Chelsea yeah. to Blair yeah. to Eve. Eve. Um, and she reached out to them unbeknownst to me. And then I get this email with pictures. She, they all gave money and time and they, they called a nursing home, not the one that my dad was in, but another nursing home, probably for the, the less, uh, financially secure people and said, are there, is there anybody that doesn't have any family there? And they were, they gave a list of three men and they provided, they had a, a gift list. So they got them all mini fridges for their rooms and then um, gifts, whether it was underwear or socks or chocolate bars or games or sweatshirts, things that they needed. And I, I was completely moved to tears. Um, there was a, a girl, Laura, that lives in Morganfield that she and her husband wrapped all the gifts and went over and took it and took videos and pictures. And I just thought, you know what? That's what the power of love and soap operas is, is all about, because that couldn't have been a more beautiful gift to people in need that I don't know. But I know that my dad was in a... Um, facility for about a year and a half and it's lonely i mean he had family but you know people forget i, I, th I think we've done we've got to do more for the aging and the people oh. that are that are shut in and it, it to me was the most beautiful thing so i thank them from the bottom of my heart there's no greater kinder gift than that uh, i must i, I mean is that beautiful? You, know, you, you, you spoke about you know, me doing this show. I mean, th these are the things that I just could not have imagined that this community has done. Oh my God. And, and thinking about that, Jim, you, you know, grew up on One Life to Live. You know, I, I assume your family watched, right? Oh, my his mother, mother learned to speak my mother. English. So my like mother. mine on Guiding Light and World Turns. Um, well, what was your, what, was it Italian? From Holland, Dutch. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, you know, like Jim, I end up working on both shows, which is just, you know, bizarre. <laughs> but, but do you realize, you know, with Cassie just describing that story, could you have ever imagined, you know, the power of what you were watching on TV and that power in your life? Like, I, I don't know if I'm articulating that right, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, I had the opportunity and unfortunately, it, it uh, that realization slipped from me as time went on. But early on, when Max was very popular, I went to <clears throat> the Children's Cancer Award over at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And I thought, you know, what are these kids? I mean, these are kids. Why are they going to what am I going to say to them? What am I going to do? What? And I went and they were just they were just happy to have anyone visit. And then there was uh, there was one young girl who was just very you know, who are you, boom, what are you here? What, and she was just like angry about the whole thing. Just boom, boom, boom. Uh, and so then I went and spoke to someone else. They said, can you back the other girl? She wants to get a picture taken with you. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Went back. And the nurses said, that's the first time she'd gotten out of her bed in three weeks. Mm -hmm. And then we had another girl, leukemia. Uh, she was completely bald. And uh, she was doing well. And I said, well, if you ever get out, come come find me at the studio and everything like that. And uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I get paged down in the basement, which is where they kept us with the mushrooms. Uh, they, so I'm not going to say what else they kept down there. Uh, 
And they said, someone's so here for, I, I'm like, I'm like, I'm, I'm just having a rough morning. I'm like, what, who is it? Bop, bop, bop. Going like, yeah, I said, well, so-and-so, who, who, what? And then all of a sudden it clicked and I ran upstairs immediately. And it was, it was the young 12 or 13 year old girl. She had on a big, bright, curly red, like little orphan handy wig and everything. And I just ran straight up. And I just, I thought, I got to keep this. I got to remember that this is the effect we have on people. I can remember the joy we can bring when, um, you know, JQ, Jimmy and I were at the height pretty much of our time at One Like to Live when JQ was born. And when we found out he was deaf, what a beautiful platform that was to help other families. And they ended up. I remember you uh, uh, speaking about it, I think, on The View yeah. or something. We did, we, we did The View. We did Oprah. Um, we did a Kringet, Kring, Congressional Hard. Caucus. A couple of them. Um, and Hard took copy, JQ. Yeah. I mean, there were a, a lot an opportunity to help people. And I remember saying to JQ, I said, did you ever, are you okay with this? And he just said, mom, we're helping people. It's like, mm. and like when he went on all my children. Yeah. He got to work with you know, Susan Lucci, Susan and, Lucci. And, and show that, you know, deaf kids are not, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a different it's like, story. Geez, now mom, it's not that do. hard. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Oh, it was so, it was so funny. We were, uh, uh, her name Lisa Minshew, the yep. actress. Okay, Lisa. yeah, he was working with her, and uh, he was. I, I would pull out his pages the night before and run everything like that. And they said, Okay, we're doing this scene, and we're going, Uh, I don't have that scene, I forgot to tear one of the scenes out that he was in. So they're trying to figure out, Okay, what are we going to do, and everything like, Okay, JQ, let's go through this right now. Boom, 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 boom. Said, okay, he's ready. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa goes, Wow, and, and I think it was, uh, um. Oh, your friend yes la oh my gosh i can't have my brain Bruce? Is working. no no anyway the director goes see alicia even a not it's this is not hard nine, even a nine-year-old a nine-year-old can, can do it no <laughs> yeah. more, no no one has any excuses anymore like Stephen well, Wolf. i go to Stephen. Stephen yeah. williford was the director he i i assume uh your son didn't get the bug from there thank you god no he jq was so natural so he, I don't think he, I don't think we really but he, wanted he would to come down to the set and he would, he would work in the costume shop for a while, learning how to sew. Then he'd be up there operating cameras and then he'd be just doing everything was a little kid. So for him, there was no fear factor. I and remember, even though it was a new studio. Was like, I, yeah, okay. I remember a day when I, Blair was in the hospital bed oh, in a geez. wedding gown and Spencer. <laughs> of course, in a wedding gown. Yeah, yeah. Spencer had, was trying to kill her and he, and I think Catherine Higlin's character had killed him and he was on the floor. JQ walks up to the set and Cindy goes, he goes, wow, somebody must have gotten fired. And I'm like going, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, oops. 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 <laughs> That's wild. Did you get a lot of reaction when you were speaking up about your story and sharing your story? Did you yeah, get people? At that time, it was a little controversial. You know, if people were, it was just, at the time when JQ was born, only a, uh, only 40, 48 states mandated, only 11 states mandated newborn screening. That means to be tested. Now, after that, I guess now all, all, 50, all 50 states mandate newborn screenings. That means when you leave the hospital, you know whether your child can hear or not. Um, that was Deafness Research Foundation. We were working we with We did a that. lot of so, whatever, yeah. however we could use whatever platform to help. But it was, it was, you know, deafness, some people feel is, or their culture is something that they don't feel like they need to be healed from, that that is their culture and that's their choice. Um, but for us, we wow. opted for the oral Most... deaf approach with the cochlear implant. And, you know, it's, 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 an, which, it's which is miraculous. You yeah, know. that beautiful story on guiding light. Yes, I, I worked with Amy yeah. through that entire thing. I mean, that was miraculous. It is miraculous. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't know that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Before I let you both go and thank you for spending all this time, no, we, 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 lo we lost another young soul to cancer, Kamar de la Re yeah. Reyes, if I pronounce it correctly. What do you remember? About de los Reyes. De los Reyes, he would say. <laughs> yes. 
uh, Kamar, really great guy. He, uh, um, I had met him. I had met him even before One Life to Live. I was opening up a gym at five o'clock in the morning and I worked from five until 10. This is between One Life to Live and Guiding Light. And Kamar was a trainer during that time. So I had known him. So when we both ended up on set, I was like, oh my gosh, you know. Um, I didn't really work with him that often um, because our characters, you know, I worked with Christian, his his brother. Um, but Kamar was, was, was a lovely guy. And I know he has deep, deep, long lasting friendships with Michael Easton and Trevor St. John. Um, and of course, there's so many couples that met on One Like to Live. He and Sherry met each other on One Like to Live. Melissa and, and David, Jimmy mm -hmm. and myself, and Fiona and her husband. Um, John. Yes, John. No, I thought you were. Scared. I mean, there's oh. just. She thought you were it. saying somebody else. Yeah, um, like, okay, well. I, Kamar's son used to come over and play with JQ because they were about the same age. Oh, they, they were like a week apart. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm. Like I said they were all big, long, big extended family at One Life to Live. One Life to Live for a long period of time was a very, very special place to be. Yeah. And then you, you used to have parties up at your house there, right? Oh, yeah, we still do. But we used definitely had uh, barn parties and we have a big pond. and uh, was, Not since COVID. Yeah. We, we haven't gotten the, back in the groove. No. <laughs> We're back. We're not back in the New York groove yet. I don't think many people are fully, you know, doing, you know, doing that. Truly, this has been a joy. Thank you both. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, tune in next time. And no joking. <laughs> okay. Still be here talking. I will still be talking. You'll still, still, still be talking. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, I, the fans would love to see you on General Hospital, both of you. But I know, Jim, you're 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 done. <laughs> but we need a comedy. We need somebody to write the two of you a fun. Oh, that comedy. would, so, that would That'll be do. so fun. I was oh. going to actually ask: Is there a comedy that you both are are watching or have watched recently that you love? We watch a lot of television. Jimmy does especially. I watch everything, so I have no idea. Everything is turned into the nothing. Yes, I agree. I can't remember. Was it that character on that? Which, 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 <laughs> I can't even keep them. I can't. I, I watch three movies in a night, and then next day I'll go, what did I watch last yeah, night? Yeah, and I can only do one because my brain needs to remember. I can't remember movies. I mean, it's so I have to have time to process it. My brain must be really messed um, up. Jim, did you watch Slow Horses on Apple TV? Oh, of course. We just finished course. third season last night. Loved it. I had yeah. not loved it's, it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'd go back and look through any of the La Carre, uh movies or the Graham Gr Green movies because it's all about that Cold War uh, espionage thing that's not the hyper-realistic James Bond whatever. They're just normal people with normal lives and, and they have very odd jobs that sometimes put their lives in danger. But no, Gary Oldman, uh, Kirsten Thomas I've always loved. I mean, yeah. I think Omen is hysterical in that role. Okay, I saw him in something else like the next day after the last one. I went, how did his body go from that to that? <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if he <laughs> looked at a very unappealing body in slow yeah. horses. Yeah, 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 totally. There's just so much good TV these days. Oh, totally. totally. So much good we're TV. Little, we're in our fourth season of Fargo right now. Oh, my God. So good. So we just watched Oppenheimer, the movie, which we had not seen, and I thought that was fabulous. Oh, I got her to watch Peaky Blinders finally. So. Oh. Yeah, I love that. Love. Oh, after, did you get her to do it after Oppenheimer because of Cillian Murphy? No, 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 no I, 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 no, no. I still can't get her to watch uh, Deadwood, but that's to me. I didn't see Deadwood, but Peaky Blinders, I loved. And the same for us. We just saw Oppenheimer maybe two or three weeks ago. Loved yeah. it. Well, I'll tell you which one, The Bear. Oh, yeah. There, it's, uh, I watched the second season. I watched it all. And then I made her watch the Christmas show. Which, which you needed a volume for. Show, <laughs> then we couldn't get season one. So she saw season two. And then season one came out. So I've seen it, I think, three, four times. And for me, the, uh, uh, the, the episode forks. And it's the guy that you hate more than any. Why can't they kill this guy in the show? And that's what you're feeling about it. 
And it was, it was, I just cried like a baby through that because of the transformation his character took in that. I think second season has such brilliant, the, the Copenhagen story, the Christmas and Forks, those three together to me are just. That Christmas episode was something just out of this world. Of and the cast. And the cast. How'd they get that cast? Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, directing that, right? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you, fans. We love you. We appreciate you. They, they have loved everything. They have loved everything. Okay. If not, have a great I weekend. Her. That's right. <laughs> love her. We love each other, by the way. Happy almost 28. Thank Thanks. you. We'll come, we'll much. have we'll celebrate our anniversary with you if you want. Just get us a call. Okay. I will. Have a cocktail, though. Don't tell the thing. Be very romantic. Holding you to that. All right. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Cassie and Jim, for spending the hour with us. Join me next Wednesday, February 7th, when award winning writer and director James Andrew Walsh stops by to tell us about his new documentary, Oscar Wilde About America, along with two of his co stars, Oscar Conlon Maury, who's making his screen debut and the incredibly talented Kate Burton. Out at the Movies has the distinct honor of hosting the world premiere of Oscar Wilde in America on February 24th. They helped bring the film to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. If you haven't yet subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do so down below. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you like today's episode, which I sure hope you did, please click the like button. As always, everybody, have a great weekend, and please, please, please stay safe.